we've encountered scope creep, meaning we've started a project and all of a sudden it's blown up into something bigger and we didn't really charge for it. Now everyone feels icky and weird. And so when you get those RFPs, you're like, okay, I've got to nail this down from the beginning. Hi there. This is your host, Vivian, and you're listening to Writing Tandem, a podcast that is all things business, entrepreneurship, and the secrets to operating a successful business while still having a life you love. Whether you're a business owner, on the verge of taking that side hustle to the next level, or just curious about the world of entrepreneurship, join me as I go behind the scenes of my own business and the businesses of others, unpacking some of the most valuable lessons you can apply today. Let's dive in. Hi, welcome to Writing Tandem. I have something really exciting for you in the next two episodes. We actually had a fantastic conversation between myself and Nicole Lindquist from the iOS Foundation just unpacking a really awesome project that Tandem Works, my company, got to do in partnership with the iOS Foundation. And we covered so much great stuff in this in this conversation, we decided to break it up into two episodes. And so the first part of the episode, we actually don't even get into what the project was. We just talk about what the setup was and how we felt about this project, what it took to put together a scope of work and some of the unknowns that we walked into, which I think is so relevant to small business owners when they're putting together RFPs or they're starting a new project with somebody. And so I'm excited to unpack that for you. And then in the second episode, you're going to hear more about the actual project, what we did, how we unpacked it, how it unfolded, what the results were, and many of the learnings that both my company, Tandem Works, had and the team here had, as well as the learnings the iOS Foundation had, our client, and just kind of how it all unfolded, how we collaborated back and forth. And there's so many golden nuggets within this conversation that in talking with Todd, who puts together our podcast here, he's like, we can't cut any of this. So we decided instead to put it together into a two-part special episode series for you. So I'm excited for you to check it out. Today, we're going to talk about stepping into the unknown and some really big unknowns, actually, collaboration, and specifically in the context of a recent project that Tandem Works, my company, embarked on with the iOS Foundation and Nicole Lindquist, who is the communications director from iOS Foundation, and the first ever interview that we've done on this podcast. Cool. So, <laughs> it's exciting. Honored. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So welcome, welcome. I was hopeful, especially since I know you a little bit now, I was like, oh, maybe I should give your introduction. And then I thought, no, you tell us about you and just your background and what you do and what you do at iOS Foundation, but just a little bit about yourself. Sure. So as a recovering journalist, I worked for the local newspaper, the Daily Nonparal, for a few years doing stories for the Southwest Iowa Beat, and then uh, moved into PR from there about 15 years ago or so now. And that was a passion of mine. I I have enjoyed getting to tell the stories of the companies that I've worked for and really came to iOS Foundation with the goal of being able to do that in my own community and to tell the stories of the grants that they provide and all that they impact and the people that they impact. And so, um, yeah, that, it, it, that's kind of my day-to-day is getting to meet the individuals who are distributing the grants and kind of what they're doing and also those folks that are impacted by them. I do a little bit of everything from PR to media relations to social media. And then really in the last few years, after we did some research that showed that our brand maybe needed a little work, I thought community relations would be the focus that we needed to work on. And so that was a lot of what this project was about, was our community relations. Yeah. Okay. So for people who don't know the iOS Foundation, what is it? A little more about that. Sure. So the iOS Foundation has been around for about 30 years now. It seems like longer to some people, I think. But really, that's not that long for a foundation. But we've been making grants for about 30 years. Um, We get funding partially from the casinos each year in fees. And then we also have our investments that we've made over the years where we're able to give away about 5% a year. And that amounts to anywhere from 10 to $15 million. So what a fun job to be able to distribute those funds and throughout the community. We think of ourselves as stewards. And then we also think of ourselves as this isn't a job of the 
10 employees that we have and the number of board members that we have, it's really we want to know from the community, what does this community need to thrive? What do you need to thrive to live and work here? So um, just why community relations is so important to us. Yeah. And projects that you're involved with, are they always with nonprofit ties or are they sometimes with small businesses? And I know economy is a piece of this. Like what are some of the projects you might be, be a part of? Sure. So to qualify for a grant, you need to be a 501c3 or you need to be a governmental entity. So like the city of Council Bluffs, any of the cities in Pottawatomie County are able to apply. Um, and so those are sort of the ground rules. We don't, don't grant to individuals. Um, and so whenever I get a request like that, I usually try to refer them on to the nonprofit that would serve those individuals because we do provide funds for them to be able to serve the individuals. We just don't do individualized grants. So not necessarily small businesses, but we do support Advanced Southwest Iowa, which is designed to support entrepreneurs. And we, we do support Kitchen Council, which is another food entrepreneurship. So we don't directly support businesses, but sort of business owners and entrepreneurs in that sense. Yeah, that's cool. And our chamber, of course. Yeah, which does have a big impact on, you know, economy and small businesses and and even when you see, I know one of the areas you talk about is just healthy families. When you have healthy families, that helps spur on small businesses as well because they can be users or every um, small business owner has a family too. And when they're healthy, you know, then they can have a healthy business. So I love how it all ties together. Yeah. I, just to add to that, with the work that we do in education and career preparedness for the workforce, that really also directly ties to businesses. What do the businesses need? They need educated employees. And so that starts at age zero, uh, working to get those kids ready for school, to go on to pursue their interest. Hopefully that's something that's offered in our community. We wanna be able to offer jobs so that people live here. And you know, just kind of a domino effect. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point. But they all tie together. They do. Yeah, it does. Everything all really ties together. And that, that's what I find interesting about, um, especially, so I'm going to go on a little tangent here, but especially as a small business owner, it's easy to start to silo yourself and go, I have to think about these things and, and not even to come up for air at times because you're just so in it. But when you can step back and start to see how all these things weave together and that there are organizations you can reach out to. And that's interesting to me that, you know, let's say a small business owner reached out to iOS Foundation thinking, oh, maybe they can be a help. You don't just say, no, we can't. It's, but we have all these connections and they do directly tie into helping you. And here's the right person I need to get you to. And I think that's really cool. Um, but back to the, the story for today <laughs> that I want to unpack. So, Nicole, you called us, uh, Tandem Works, Michaela and I. Gosh, I want to say, you'll have to fill it in. It feels like maybe almost two years ago with an original proposal of, hey, are you interested in taking on this sort of research project? We, we're trying to decide what direction to go and how to collect feedback from the community. What do we need to collect? And just sort of like this overarching strategy. At the time, we were really intrigued with that project. And we were at full capacity with our other clients. And so we really debated for a while because we're like, this is so us. We feel like this would be such a great project. We've always wanted to work with the iOS Foundation. But ultimately, we said, hey, we're at capacity. We don't think we could do this justice right now. And that was a scary thing to do as a small business, like just to, to tell you, I don't know if I've ever told you, it was kind of scary to email you back and say, what a great opportunity. We'd love to do it. This feels like a really good connect uh, connection here, and we can't do it. I respected that. I actually felt like when you said that, it made me feel like you understood the scope of the project and how big it was and that you wouldn't be able to honor the hours that it would be. And we get that. I mean, you don't have a large staff. So I respect that. And, you know, by proving yourself through all of your other work and connections in the community, it was it was a great, um, just felt like a deferral, not necessarily a decline. And so... Um, I think from there, it was just like, okay, well, we'd love to work with them again. They just don't have the capacity right now. So when we can in the future, hopefully we can make it work out because we, I still feel like that would have been a great match. Um, also though, part of that was doing research on, on our brand. And so 
when we have somebody that doesn't know the community at all, maybe they can kind of not come in with any assumptions. And so that that part of it was made a little sense. But at the same time, um, I would love to see your proposal. <laughs> but I think <laughs> I, I had tons of respect for your decision in that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I just wanted to bring that story up because I know that, again, especially small businesses, like you want to grow and you want to thrive and you want to take every project that comes in the door. It's really hard to say no because you're saying no to your paycheck. And you're saying no. We thought, we were a little worried. I mean, we knew you a bit, you know, we chatted back and forth, but there's always that fear. And so I I love how you talked about that. There is that fear that we're going to turn this down and they're going to think we couldn't handle it. Or they're going to think, oh, they didn't come through for us. So we're, we won't approach them again. Or you're going to go fall in love with somebody else. You know, I think that's one of the big things like, oh no, like we didn't even get to go on a first date. What if we were a great match? But interestingly, you reached out with the second half of the project, and I was hoping you would tell us a little bit about what was that second half of the project, um, and why did you reach out? So the second half of the project was, well, let me just back up a little bit and tell about what the first half of the project resulted in, which was really a communications audit in all forms and a brand, almost a brand audit of the iOS Foundation. Where are we at with the community? What do they think of when they think of us? What are the challenges? What are, what are people saying that we need to address these elephants in the room? Where are th- ways we can build uh, what are the misconceptions? So many things. And I, that was scary. That was also a scary project. Like, oh man, I've been in this role for five years now, six years, whatever it was. And what if, what if what I've done hasn't been effective? You know, I've, I've been constantly trying to get the word out about what we do and how we do it and be transparent. And, um, so it almost felt like an audit on you. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit, but I knew it was for the greater good, so to speak. And so I was able to kind of put my pride aside and just be, um, realize that I'm also not the brand. I mean, the brand is experiences in the community. It is, you know, how our website functions. It's so many different things. So I I knew that deep down, but it is also as a department of one in the communications department, hard not to feel like that's my personal responsibility is to make sure everyone has positive, happy thoughts when they think of us. So you were like really putting yourself, I just want to stop for a minute and go, you really did put yourself on the line. And like you mentioned, a department of one, like our audience here is kind of, you know, small business owners, entrepreneurs. So they tend to be sort of these departments of one, even when they're running large teams, you feel like you're alone. And I just want to point that out. Like even people who are maybe not in a, like you don't own the business or you're not, you know, in a traditional entrepreneur situation, you are though. Like you are the person, you don't have this whole team to rely on. Like it's a very similar. Yeah, we're very collaborative in our on our team, but I'm the only person with the communications experience, you know, education and, and life experience, but they're very helpful and creative too. But at the same time, at the end of the day, you know, I, I need to be the one to be responsible for it. So yeah, yeah I, I, that was a little nerve wracking. But from that, we did find kind of what we already knew a little bit, that we had some work to do in being authentic and really listening to the community. And so that was probably our our main finding. We need to do a better job of being out there and truly listening and not just talking at people. Keep continuing to work on transparency. That's never done. It's Mm -hmm. ongoing for the rest of your life. You never, Mm -hmm. oh, check. And so, and little things. Um, I won't go into it, but you know, what happened with the medians on West Broadway, for example, I mean, that stayed with a lot of people. I mean, that was part of an election. And so it's like those things, you know, we need to continue to learn from those experiences and what can we do differently next time? So those were some of the things that came out. And the good news about that for me was, well, we haven't maybe done a, a all we can do in listening to the community let's do that. Let's, let's go out there and hear from them, especially with our new CEO coming on, Brenda Mainwaring, and her kind of coming up on that five-year milestone of it's time to revisit the vision of the, the foundation and the mission and to really look at the vision of what this can be in the future because things have really changed with 
the pandemic and just the way that people do business and work anymore. And so it was time to look at that. And we thought, this is a step that we need to authentically take as we move forward with that in listening to the community. So then you reached out to us. Yes. And a little side note here. You reached out with an RFP, Request for Proposal. And I just wanted to point out real quickly, not having had a background in, you know, all things small business, I learned what an RFP was back when I was about 23. And I, I love it now when those come through where I'm like, I know what that means. So I just wanted to throw out, because not everybody knows what that means. So just a learning moment. So RFP. I think there's two or three different things you can probably call them. Um, but yes, I'm glad you pointed that out because... It can be intimidating when you first see There's, it. There can be lots of acronyms. I remember first like Googling it. Again, I think I was like 23. We got this, you know, RFP for some job. And I'm like, RFP? Yeah. What on earth is this? So it comes from you. I'm like, oh, this is old hat. Like I know what this means, but I wanted to point that out. So. Sure, sure. So I think on the first one we did the RFP and that was quite the process of receiving those proposals and just writing the RFP. You have to really know what you want out of something. And then... The reason I just love working with you guys is because that is really hard to, to, to go through an RFP process and to make sure at the beginning of a project that you know exactly what you're going to want at the end. And you can state that clearly for a client who might never have heard of you um, or a vendor who might never have heard of you before to be flexible in that, like, and to know that things may, you you can work with them as you go. And so I think the second time around, um, we probably had a better idea that we'd be working with you. So it's like, okay, here's what we kind of want to do. Here's what we kind of want it to look like. What would that even cost? So we kind of balance between RFPs and, you know, going about it a little more informally. But my preference is the latter, just because it is so hard to know and articulate um, and to make sure that even though you might see it that way. The, the person interprets it that way. So we definitely, I think the thing that we really saw in Tandem Works was you are community-based. You know this community. You bring so much more to the table than just any agency. It's the connections. It's that willingness to go above and beyond when things shift and change. Like, okay, not just, oh, that wasn't in our original RFP proposal contract, nah, da, 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 you know, here's what we need to do to make that happen and just kind of continuing those conversations. So we knew that you guys would be a great partner in that and it worked out so well. We're well, still just really happy. Thank you. I appreciate that. We don't have to sit here and talk about how awesome we are, but I appreciate it. <laughs> it was one of the things that I thought was really great being able to work through this and I wanted to be able to talk about because my original impression for starting in business was, okay, you get this RFP, this request for proposal, and it looks very official. And they can be intimidating because it's like, like you said, oh my gosh, I've got to know exactly what I'm going to charge, what the deliverables are, like keep scope, right? We, we've encountered scope creep, meaning we've started a project and all of a sudden it's blown up into something bigger and we didn't really charge for it. Now everyone feels icky and weird. And so when you get those RFPs, you're like, okay, I've got to nail this down from the beginning. But to point out, you as, um, as the client contracting us, there is a, often a lot of flexibility there. You know, we forget that there's a human on the other end of the RFP who also isn't 100% sure, or maybe they are, and if you need clarification, they're more than happy. I know you and I, we jumped on the phone. We're just like, hey, let's have a chat about this. Can you explain this? What are you thinking here? Like, give me some more context. And just having the courage to just reach out to each other either way. But again, for that business owner, there's this real sense, this need to impress. And like if I don't impress you, it's like this courting thing, right? If I don't impress you right off the bat, maybe you'll take the request away or we won't get it because I looked like I didn't know what was going on. When in fact, we're just having a conversation to get closer to it, which now I've learned more, and I'd love your perspective of, I think in some ways it can help you win that RFP to not know all the answers. What, I don't know. What do you think? Sure. So I don't want to continuously, you know, feel make you feel like I'm just, you know, complimenting you for the sake of it. I, I, I paid want, you before you came. Yeah, exactly. No, real. I just, these are the, like, we loved working with you, and here's why. So try not to blush too much, but yeah. <laughs> I feel like the reasoning is, so 
in my past experiences, we've done other RFPs and, you know, you go through the process of the interviews, the questions, you know, those types of things. And you have, you know, a sales team who's designed to land the contract. Then they have to go on and communicate that with the team of managers that might be assigning that out. Then you have to go on and communicate that to the people who are going to be maybe doing the work. So a lot can get lost in translation. So I think small businesses have an advantage, Mm. you know, when it's not going through so many layers and things are getting lost and, you know, forgotten about in translation. So I think that's a real bonus when you can not only be the person from top to bottom or, you know, maybe a few layers in there, but it's, it's smaller. And then also just being forthright about, Hey, this doesn't, those conversations are icky for the people on the other end too. I hate having to like, you know, like we need to change this or whatnot. But I felt like you always made us comfortable. Like, here's where we're at. What do you think? And I'm really receptive to that. Like, you're right. We want to be fair. We don't want to, you know, ask you to do work that you're not compensated for, but we did change our mind. So w- let's meet in the middle and, and figure this out. Um, I, th- I thought you did a great job of doing that and addressing it before things, you know, got too far along and, and people are like, well, wait, you said you would do this, but now you're not going to, or mm-hmm. we thought this was understood as part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're always going to come to those crossroads within your project, no matter how well your RFP was written. So just being willing to be honest and open and, you know, here's where we're at. This took longer than we thought. Things like that, I think I personally really appreciate. And then I feel like I can trust and work with that person again and again going forward. That's a good point. And we did hit, I mean, you know, there's always the little things. And when they're a lot of times you'd be like, you know what, we're just going to give a little on that one or, or you know, we're going to take a little and we go back and forth. We did hit a big one that n- neither of us had thought of because, note again, you can't know everything when sure. you're going in. But we kind of missed a big one of, um, and we'll talk a little bit about how this project unrolled, but there was a bunch of data to crunch. Mm-hmm. And we'd sort of talked a little bit about like, we're going to need data. Oh, yeah, we've got some on our team. We could probably crunch that a little bit. Well, we'll compile it. We'll... What will that look? But we didn't know how we were collecting this this said data at the time, and we got to the end of our first session, which was fun, and we were like, "Holy cow, what do we do?" You know, and just to have that moment, and then just have a conversation of like, "We can't, we don't want to blow this scope completely out of the water on either end, but this data's got to be dealt with. Like, what do we do?" And so there are those moments that come up. And so, yeah, I agree. Like when you can have that conversation, even over little things at the beginning, it helps when that big thing lands on the table and you go, all right, we got to figure this out. Um, and we found a great way to collaborate on that. We don't have to you know, dive into all of the nitty gritty, but just to point that out, not to be intimidated on either side for the client to say, I've changed my mind, I want this, or things have just changed. And then as the business owner to say, all right, how can we step into that? I see too often business owners go, well, they, duh, 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 right? Like it, we can get defensive and go, um, well, they should have thought of that. Or, if, you know, and it's easy to put the blame. But when you can come to the table and both say, yep, this is a big difference or a big change and it's an opportunity. And I love how, you know, you saw that as an opportunity. Sure. I think the important thing to remember too is your time is money on both sides. And so, when thinking about what you want um, from the client perspective, know that things that things that you want are going to take a certain amount of time. And then from, you know, the, the perspective <laughs> of the other side, you know, you're either going to have to pay for that or you're going to need to do, your employees are going to need to step up and, and do that. I had a thought on what that kind of resulted in. And I think it is like, so for example, Brenda is a very big picture thinker. I'm in the weeds every day with my stuff. And so when she would say, we want to do a survey. And it's like, the inclination is to say, yes, obviously, from your perspective. I think that's good. Yes, but or yes, and, you know, let's Think about what that means. We're going to need to have this by this and this by this and this day. What do we want out of this? Not just the 
big picture, it would be great if. Mm -hmm. Like, I I am going to learn from this that don't be afraid to jump in those weeds maybe a little bit, maybe not at that time, Mm -hmm. but... I know you said you wanted this. Here's what this is going to result in. This is going to result in we're going to have to have X, Y, Z. This is going to be X more hours. You know, don't be afraid to to think through those things. If a casual, oh, and we'll do this. You know, what does that mean? It's okay to say yes, but on on both sides, but that's going to mean this. Mm -hmm. And here's how. That's a great point. And I appreciate you bringing it up because, again, the the vendor, the business owner, we want to say yes. Mm -hmm. You know, like whatever you want. We'll make it happen. You know, when will you write the check is kind of like where it often goes because you want that business to come in or you want to earn the opportunity the next time or you really want the project. Like it's a cool project. Mm. And so I love that of going, yes, and can we talk about that more? Or there's always a way. Could we help? Could we understand what you're really trying to, to get there? Because sometimes there's a solution that you have that the client doesn't even know about. And that comes up too. You know, there's another way to get there that could be more impactful or might help their budget or, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things there. So I love that. All right, my friends, that's the first part of this two-part conversation between myself and Nicole Lindquist from the iOS Foundation. And my hope is that on you this episode feel of some encouragement tandem, here we've and encountered to scope about creep, embarking on to a new we've project, started a project and all of a In the next episode, we're going to unpack and we didn't what really this project for it. Really now was, how it unfolded, and, and so when and you get those RFPs, you're like, okay, I've got to nail this down the way as we embark there. This is your host, Vivian, and you're listening to Writing Tandem. A podcast that is all things Writing business, Tandem is recorded on location at the studios secret, on South Ford in Council Bluffs, Iowa, business, in cooperation still having with a Todd Studer Productions. Whether you're a business owner on the verge of taking that side hustle to the next level, or just curious about the world of entrepreneurship, join me as I go behind the scenes of my own business and the businesses of others, unpacking